You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is March 29, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, employment contracts. Our presenter is Kyle Clausen. He's with Resolve Physician Agency in Columbia, Missouri. Before we start, I just want to make sure that you guys know I'm here really to answer questions. So feel free to stop me at any point in time if you have something specific you want more information on. Um, I'm happy to provide that and answer what's important and relevant for you all. So um, that's really my goal here today. And I'm going to try to touch on some of the major topics and the major issues in, in most employment contracts that, that you may see um, or may have seen if, you, if you're just finishing up that process. So how do I advance? Is it just scrolling down? Yeah, you should be able to click on that or you can use your arrow. Okay, there we go. Okay, a uh, few disclosures up front. Uh, you know, MSMA is the one that has kind of introduced us uh, to each other and, and wanted to put these these on, so I'm happy to be here. I um, have no employment relationship with them or ACP, um, but am the Vice President of Results Physician Agency. I'm barred in three different states, and like Jeff Hines may have alluded to, um, our clients are really all over the place, nationwide, and, and we've seen a lot of contracts here, um, probably more than anyone regionally for sure, uh, and it's very few attorneys devote their entire practice to this one special niche area, so um, that's who I am, and, and want to make sure that you guys get any questions that you have answered, because it's, it's really here to, to try to provide that benefit to you. Um, so getting started, the, the most frequent question that we get off the bat or that people come back to is um, how do I actually get a contract and when when can this process start happening? And so just wanted to give you a brief overview of who you may be interacting with in the, the negotiation process and, and in trying to obtain that contract. I've got listed out here four bullets uh, of different firms that you may run into. And I think it's important for you to understand their financial relationships with each of those. Um, because it can directly affect your compensation and your negotiating leverage. So the first is contingency and retained recruiting firms, the first two bullets there. Um, that makes up the majority of job postings and phone calls that you all may be getting um, quite frequently with jobs that are listed out there. They are, if you want to think of them as an external HR department, their job is to try to sell you on a position and get you to commit to a certain area. And if, you, if they're successful in doing that, um, they charge the employer generally between fifteen dollars and $50,000 for placing you. And what I want to draw your attention to there is that if, if the employer is, is allocating that amount of money uh, to a third party, that likely means that that could have been money that could have been in your pocket instead, um, whether that's an assigning bonus or student loan repayments or just additional base compensation. Um, there's money that's going to a third party there, and so I just want to make sure that you're careful um, when you're talking with those folks about how much information you disclose, um, what you're willing to take for compensation, all that information is going to be relayed back to the employer um, as you go through the contract process. So they, they don't work for you, they really do work for, for the other side. Um, the third bullet is in-house recruitment. That's definitely an HR department. So if, if you're at a university setting or a larger health system, they generally have internal um, physician recruitment there as well. Um, and there's obviously they're employed um, by that that entity, but there's no bonus or commission you know fee generally set up um, for them. Uh, so that's that's more of a traditional HR department. And then there's also agencies out there, and that's folks that represent physicians, represent um, you all as as you go out into the world, whether that's searching for jobs or helping you with contracts, things like that. Um, if you think about it in a real estate transaction of buyers and sellers agents, um, that there are those two sides. And so I want to make sure that you're very careful on who you're talking to and what information you're disclosing to, to which side and if they actually have your interest uh, in mind or not. Are there any questions on that? No. No? Okay. So when you've gone through the the, the interview stage and it's time to actually have a contract presented, these are kind of the four basic steps that most processes follow. In your final interview, they'll disclose most of the basic terms for you uh, verbally as far as salary, uh, time off, um, work requirements, call, etc. 
and that, that's followed up with some type of formal proposal, uh, whether that be an actual full employment agreement or a letter of intent. And a letter of intent is usually a one-page document that summarizes exactly what they told you uh, at the final interview regarding salary benefits, signing bonuses, etc. cetera. Um, what I want to draw your attention to there is just to be careful on whether or not that letter is binding or non-binding as far as establishing the employment relationship. Um, each of those are different, and each employer has different expectations uh, once those are signed. And we've had some clients who have had multiple interviews, you know, three or four positions that they're very interested in, and they've signed letters of intent to two or three of those to get the full employment contract, only later to find out that one of the letters of intent was essentially the full employment contract. That's, that's all they had intended to provide. And so you really want to be careful uh, before you sign those that you understand the intent behind that on, on the employer's side. Um, once you have the letter of intent signed, they usually issue you a full employment agreement. Those can range, and especially if you've just gone through the process, anywhere from four pages to 50 pages, uh, depending on organization. And so there's quite a variance there. And then finally, execution, where both sides have, have agreed to terms to the drafting and redrafting stage, and, and you sign on the dotted line. A few tips there, just for your own personal record keeping. Um, I would have at least two or three copies signed with original signature with, with original ink that you can keep one of those copies for your records. Um, should there ever be a dispute in the future, you, you have a little more um, power with, with the original document rather than just a copy. So, so make sure that that's something you're doing uh, logistically at the end. Okay, so now that, now that we're through the, the, the process in, in, in obtaining the contract, I want to hit on some of the major areas and um, sections of a contract that you're likely to see. The, the first is obviously who, who the parties and who the, who, who the parties are to the contract. They're usually not a big issue, but the one area that I do want to draw your attention to is if you're joining a smaller group practice, um, if it's a solo practitioner or a two or three man group, certain states have specific entities that physicians need to fall under for that practice type and certain entities that they're barred from practicing medicine under. And you really want to make sure that you know what entity you're actually being an employee of. And you know, your attorney taking a look at that should handle it, but that's, that's obviously the first, first box that you need to check um, as you start the, the contracting process. The next two bullets, duties and schedule and compensation and benefits, are probably the two most important areas that our clients want to talk about, and so I've got those listed here first. Um, schedule, we found, is more important to 90% of graduating physicians than, than compensation is. And what you need to look out for there is whether your schedule is discretionary, meaning completely up to the employer on how that's set, or if it's more of a, an established objective, um, you know, hours are set, days are set, call coverage, uh, making sure that there's some type of cap on that so you know what your requirements are going to be. Um, all of those things are, are very important and generally the first contract that comes over and the employers definitely prefer to have it as more of a discretionary setup um, where they have control and flexibility to set that as they choose. Um, so be careful on that. The, the middle bullet there under duties, the clinical administrative and teaching, if you have an interest in doing research or, or teaching, uh, whatever the situation may be, um, really encourage you to get the amount of time for each of those set in the contract so there's no um, question or dispute later on, on on how much time needs to be reserved for your research um, or how much administrative time you should have allocated each week. Um, those are the, the main points I would have you take a look at in the schedule. On your compensation and benefits, the, the fairness question comes up uh, quite a bit, and that's, that's really what most of our clients want to see, is that they're being paid fairly for their services, and, and all of that depends on location and the type of practice that they're in. But here's some of the things that you can look for that are very common. Um, some type of base salary is generally offered, um, as well as a incentive productivity type model um, beyond that. The measures for the productivity is, is really important. 
Um, and depending on practice, it's, it's either measured in RVUs, um, billings, or collections uh, are the three main factors that they look at. Um, do you all know what RVUs are? Yes. Yes? Okay. Um, so each patient encounter has a certain value attached to it. And what you want to be careful of is that your RVU threshold or your collection threshold, whatever it is, is at an appropriate level for your specialty. And what I mean by that is there's, there's third-party surveys out there and there's, there's market data for you to take a look at that will show you the medians and the averages for the area of, of how much volume is needed to generate a certain salary. And what I always encourage our clients to look at is that if your base salary is set at a certain level, you also want your, your productivity bonus to kick in at, at approximately the same percentage level um, based on those, those surveys. And the reason for that is um, if, you're, if your productivity threshold kicks in at a, at a level that's much higher, um, you know, let's say your, your base is at the median at you know, 50% and your RVU level kicks in at about 70%, um, you're essentially working, you know, that 20% of RVUs on the survey, um, all of that revenue is flowing directly to your employer without any benefit to you. So you want to get those tied in as close as possible um, when, you're, when you're negotiating compensation. Of those three, Mr. Glosson, that you mentioned, would you be best off then um, having that based on your bill billing as opposed to your RVUs or your collections? Because I've seen a lot of people yeah. get collections yeah the, the collections is what would worry me the most the billings and the RVUs I think are are a, a better indicator of actual volumes collections you just lend yourself to you know type of payments if you're seeing a lot of Medicare Medicaid patients versus you know someone on, on Blue Cross your collections could be quite different and that doesn't change the work that you did uh, it just changed what's, what's coming in the door so most private practices, if it's a small group, they generally tend to work off of collections um, because they operate just more like a small business. Uh, you know, they pay out what comes in. Um, larger health systems generally tend to have some type of RVU set up um, or component to their, their productivity. Uh, and that's what I would prefer. I would prefer billings or RVUs. Can I ask you one other thing? You may be going to mention this later on, but um, a number of years ago I was, um, I was in um, – private practice and I worked for a group and I was um, doing a lot of satellite clinics and traveling and um, there was, uh, you know, a question about, you know, compensation for the time traveling and also for the mileage and for wear and tear of my car and all that sort of stuff. So um, do you have any suggestions on that sort of thing? Because it's, we see more frequently now that a lot of these groups that our fellows are joining have multiple satellite clinics and they're they're expected to go to more than one location anymore. Definitely. Uh, multiple locations will come into a few different sections here, but that's, that's definitely one of them. As far as what your professional expenses or your business expenses are allowed by that group, um, you'd want to make sure mileage, you know, obviously that's covering wear and tear on the car, and your time is all part of that. Um, and it's, it's, it's depending on each, you know, obviously each situation is a little bit different, but if, if there's going to be a certain amount of time at each, each site, I would also want that listed out in the duties of I'm spending one day here, you know, one day at this next clinic, um, clinic site, et cetera. Uh, you try to spell that out as much as you can. Because, I mean, one of the clinics that I went to, I was traveling almost two hours each way. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so where, where somebody else in the group may be, you know, going to some location that's 15 minutes away to another satellite clinic. Correct. So you're seeing less patients and whatever, spending more time on the road, being less productive because you're spending less time on the road, and and um, I would think that there's some way, a mechanism to be compensated for that. Yeah, there there definitely is, and I think you'd want to ask them, well, as part of almost the interview process, of what type of volumes are at each of those satellite clinics, and is it going to hurt your ability to make bonus or to, to meet your productivity threshold? Um, they should have historical data on each of those sites and also the new practice, um, which would, you know, be, be important to review prior to signing. Thank you. Good question. Um, a few other components that you'll see uh, listed under there are signing bonuses, um, stipends while you complete training, educational loan forgiveness, and then also your CME allowance. All of those are things that you should look out for. 
and are very common. Uh, the statistics recently was uh, approximately 65% of all physician contracts now have some type of signing bonus assigned with them. So it's becoming more of the, the norm uh, than it probably was five to ten years ago. Uh, so definitely something to ask for if there's not, not one included. Could you explain what you mean by residency stipend? Sure. Um, residency stipend meaning uh, a lot of practices or even larger health systems will pay a stipend or almost an advanced signing bonus while uh, residents and fellows finish training if they commit to come you know, to their facility when they complete. And so we, we have clients that have signed as early as two years prior to finishing training and then the health system will pay them a certain amount each month as almost an advanced signing bonus uh, to them, you know, for their commitment. So I get so that. If, yeah. I'm terrified I won the second years. I actually have it so that I get a stipend like every month, but then it comes out mm -hmm. of my first year's pay. So my first year I'll get paid less, but I got kind of an advanced salary so that we can, you know, pay for the move and pay for our, a down payment on our house and that sort of thing. It's mm -hmm. a little different than it wasn't extra money, but it was given prior to my action mm -hmm. starting. Is that something yeah, that, or you would think that it should be more um, more taxed. of a bonus? You'd be taxed less on. now than you would be taxed when you have a higher you're gonna be in a higher uh, bracket sure. later. So it's actually sure. maybe somewhat beneficial if you need that advance. That's true. Yeah, from a tax side of it, there's a few different things to consider. Most signing bonuses and stipends are set up on some type of forgiveness. So if you decide not to show up, you know, to work, um, you probably have to repay, you know, any type of signing bonus or stipend that they provide. And those are forgiven usually over a, the term of the contract, which is generally three years. It's probably the most common term that we see. So they'll forgive one third of that each year. And from a tax perspective, you're taxed when it's forgiven. That's that's when it's actually income to you when you don't you, when you no longer have the obligation to repay that. So if you can get it front loaded, I, I would agree your tax bracket is generally lower while you're in residency than it will be when you're out. Um, but they it may not be allowed depending on the type of setup that they have in their contract. Okay. Do you ever see that being just given as a bonus instead of having to be yeah. taken out of your first year salary? I, I do. I, I see it, you know, probably 50-50, but I would say at least half of the time it, it is almost an advanced signing bonus. It's not anything that's taken out of the base. It's just an advance on what they would, would have offered um, that first year. Now, you, you can call these things whatever you want, but what you really need to look at is what your total compensation is when you're looking at kind of the medians and the averages and, and what you're comparing side by side between different offers. Um, you, know, you can call something a signing bonus, but it's really just first year's income. And so, that's what I was going to um, ask you. Like you mentioned, that a lot of person, you know, sixty-five percent have a signing bonus, and if it's not there, you might ask for it. But wouldn't it be more beneficial to, you know, increase your yearly compensation because that's really what's going to last over time? Some of the signing bonuses may be ten thousand dollars, but if you negotiate even five thousand dollars more a year, then you're over time looking at a much more profitable. That's, I, I agree. I think it depends on where the where the base compensation is set at. If you're already set at the median or a little above the median for your base, um, they're probably going to be unlikely to bump that up. I got but you. if it's you know yeah, if you have the option to increase you know a ten thousand dollar signing bonus or ten thousand dollars a year, you'd obviously want to take the ten thousand a year um, because that's going to guarantee more in the long run. And the, oh, the bon the signing bonus is that is that, is that like um, five percent of what your your anticipated salary is, or how do they come up with the amount for that? You know, it's it's all supply and demand, really. Um, practices that are in major metros or more highly desirable locations generally have smaller signing bonuses because they don't need to offer them to entice someone to come. If you're going to a more rural area or somewhere that there's been a shortage for quite a while, um, they may be a little more aggressive on a one-time payment to induce someone to relocate to the area to set up practice. And it also varies by specialty, you know, what okay. what that number will be. What what are kind of ranges are we talking about? <laughs> pretty pretty wide. Um, we've seen them as, as small as five thousand dollars and I've seen them as high as two hundred thousand dollars. 
So, you know, I think the average is probably between 10 and 30. Uh, you know, most of them fall in that range, um, with 50 being a general outlier as far as that's a, you know, the higher end of the averages. But like I said, I have seen them as high as 200,000 for certain specialties. So quite, quite a range. Have you seen in general um, people or employers being willing to modify their RVU structure or their collection structure in terms of what percentage you might get? Because for a lot of us, uh, it seems like as people are moving towards that model, like you're not even going to have a base salary. For example, a contract that I was offered, I'll have a base salary guaranteed for two years, but the second year, if I make more, I could certainly get more based on production. And the third year, it's all based on production. So mm -hmm. again, to me, negotiating an increase in my base salary really makes very little sense to me because that's for like a year or two, whereas I'd rather have you know more of my production come my way. Is that mm -hmm. something that you've seen people are more willing to do or now that that's more how it's based? No, I think it's something they are. I think what's important there is knowing how how it's going to be collected in year three or, or I guess calculated in year three if it's an RVU system and what that threshold is and what they're paying and you know what the conversion factor is you know what are they paying you per RVU um, like there's that out there on that as well like but, mine would be a collection so you get a portion of your collections okay it, you know you could get it in your second year if it happens to be more than the base that they're offering if you just happen to see more but third you're mm -hmm. all on your own and you just get a percentage of your collections, which again, and then that's potentially the rest of your, you know, if you become partner, I guess it's a little bit different, but if you just stayed as an employee, you'd always get just a percentage of your collection. And I didn't know mm -hmm. if, if people are, if you found that they are willing to adjust that. Cause that's, Is it a private group? Yeah. They, they may. Private groups are, you know, have the ability to change their contract a little bit easier because it's only you know, a few people making that decision. What I would really want to know in that situation is what their overhead is uh, to, to make sure that the percentage that they're giving you of collections is, is fair and that the practice itself isn't taking too much of a slice, you know, out of your revenues. And what is what is reasonable? So I've always heard that, you know, your overhead tends to be about 50% of your, mm -hmm. um, you know, collection or billing or what are your revenue. So if they're giving, you know, assuming that out of your 100% collections, they're paying 50% for your overhead, how much should is typical or what should you kind of expect to get out of it? Well, you know, I mean, I would want Fairly. as much as possible, obviously, but, um, yeah, I think 5%, between 5 and 10% is usually what I see as far as practices retaining for themselves off of an employed or, you know, off of an associate. So they cover the overhead, they, they make a little bit of profit off of that person, and then the rest goes directly to that position. Interesting. So if they're at 50% overhead, I would I would want your collections or your percentage to be at least at 40. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that would be my preference. Obviously, the higher the better. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Okay, we saw, we're sorry we sidetracked you a little bit here. <laughs> Anybody else uh, on that one? Okay, we can try to get through a, a few more here. But good questions. Um, PTO is just vacation, paid time off, and leave of absences, uh, CME time. All of that should be included um, in the contract and spelled out um, as well. Um, one thing that you may want to check on is holidays. A lot of times, practices won't won't list in the contract whether or not they the office is closed for holidays, and so you want to know that before you're taking a look at what you think is fair from a from a vacation standpoint. Um, next slide here. Uh, the first one is is definitely important to you. The the liability insurance. You want to know who's who's responsible for purchasing that, who's paying for it, and what the limits are. You know, per occurrence uh, versus in the aggregate over the year. And then the most important thing is what type of policy it is. Is it an occurrence policy or a claims made policy? And the reason that that's important is because if it's a claims made policy and, and you ever leave that practice, um, there's going to be a requirement or a need for tail coverage. And tail coverage is a, is a real expense for whoever has to pay for it. It's generally um, one and a half to two times the annual premium 
of whatever was being paid on a yearly basis for your insurance. And so if, if you're responsible for that, should you ever leave, um, you need to know that up front and, and need to try to negotiate that as, as part of the total compensation uh, that you're being paid. Does that make sense? Do you guys all understand what tail coverage is and, yeah. and why you need it? Okay. Okay. The other thing I don't see I have it up here, maybe you'll talk about it, and I'm getting out of the gun, but um, what about um, disability insurance? Disability insurance, is that's a great topic. Um, some employers will offer some type of, of DI coverage. Um, if you're into a private setting or if you're early on in your career, <clears throat> I would almost recommend having a policy that's that's outside of your employer. It's something that's portable that you can take with you should you decide to leave. Um, you know, and head somewhere else. <clears throat> but those those things are all generally provided in some type of benefits package. They're usually not spelled out in the contract itself. You know, health insurance, things like that. They're usually incorporated by reference, and then they just provide you with their benefits package. So you you probably won't actually see it in the contract, but it it will be something that's provided by many employers. Because I I had a actually when I was in private practice. It was initially um, in my contract, they spelled out the disability policy, and then mm -hmm. just before I signed, they pulled out the disability part of it and told me I was going to have to pay for that myself. <laughs> <laughs> nice of them. Yeah, this you know, the day the contract's being signed. So Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, the more details, the better, but I, I don't see details like that very often in, in the contracts now. Like I said, it's, it's usually just kind of a benefit section that says you'll be entitled to the same benefits as every other physician, and they have that policy set outside of the outside of the contract. Okay. Okay. Um, one way that you can meet in the middle, this is uh, something that's not listed here, but um, if there's a dispute on who's going to pay for tail, um, one of the things that you can try to protect yourself on is that if for some reason they terminate you without cause, so if they let you go, and we'll talk about termination here in a minute, but if they just decide to let you go for no reason, um, I generally like to see the practice pick up the tail coverage in that situation, um, and vice versa. If you decide to walk away and leave you know, them, um, you would be responsible for it. It's, it's, it's a nice way to meet in the middle and to, to possibly spare yourself some risk and some expense uh, if it doesn't work out and they decide to let you go. Um, partnership requirements, if it is a private group, I want to get those requirements established in as objective a form as possible. Um, it's pretty difficult to, to actually have that done. Most practices are pretty hesitant on putting, you know, a certain number, uh, you know, or a volume of patients that you need to see or revenue that you would generate before you can come partner. It's usually they want to make sure you're a cultural fit, you know, et cetera, that, that's working out for everybody, that you're a hard worker. Um, but try to get as, as much of that dialed in as possible, you know, time frame, um, and any other factors that they're going to consider. The, Outside intro, oh, go ahead. I just mentioned something. So the, the partner thing, I've also seen that quite variable. Some, uh, you know, there's some smaller allergy practice in the past where some of our fellows have joined where there's no buying at all, basically. There's been some that the partnership was, you know, um, a few thousand dollars. And it was one practice I looked at um, when I was a fellow, and this is, you know, over 20 years ago, um, where the buy-in was a million dollars, and um, they, were, they were going to they were going to do that over 10 years, and they were they would take that out of my salary before taxes, apparently to save me money, um, um, you know, out of my salary over the course of 10 years or something. So, um, I mean, is there as far as the partnership thing, as far as these buy-ins and and you know, how do you figure out what's what's the you know, an equitable, equitable amount to be paying to be, you know, for that practice, et cetera, and what the worth Dr. of that practice is. Is, now is there any the formula for that or equation, or how do you figure Dr. that out? You know, it, it really depends on each situation. It's not a set formula. What I would want to know is, you know, do as much due diligence as you can on the front end of what being a partner actually gets you. Um, you know, how much additional revenue are you going to see or additional income are you going to see by being a partner? Uh, what are you buying into? Is it real estate that's separate from the actual practice itself um, or not? And then trying to get an evaluation of, of what that's actually worth. Um, 
I agree with you on the buy-in numbers. <laughs> some are very low. Some of the thousand dollars, you know, almost a, you know, just a very minimal amount, just to make sure that there's consideration in the in the purchase. Some are, are very high. So do as much homework as you can and get as much financial information as you can on the front end. But like I said, they're going to be pretty hesitant to actually put that in a in a contract to list purchase price or list anything else out. It's it's usually all determined by some type of accounting firm at the time of purchase to make sure you're paying fair market value. Because the other thing I've seen is there are some practices um, where they're basically renting space um, and they don't have any real estate. Uh, however, I've, I've I've looked at a couple practices where they had just bought you know or built a new building or whatever, bought a building, and you were you know kind of being required to pay for that building, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I didn't know if there's you know how you you know as you said uh, at the time people. They had a, an account come in and said, well, this would be the buy-in, and this is how we figured it out or something. And it was kind mm -hmm. of mumbo-jumbo, and you go, okay, you know. But um, there, I've seen it so variable that um, I was just curious if there was any reasonable way of trying to figure it out to, to protect yourself. Well, I, I think what I would want to know is, like any other investment in life, is what your return on investment is. So if you're going to invest $100,000 uh, to buy into this practice, what's what are you getting in additional revenue per year to justify that that amount of money? And that's that's the type of analysis I would want to do um, on the front end before buying in. You know, you, trusting the accountant is one thing of, of making sure that the equipment in the building is valued at a certain level. But then, you know, you need to know what you're getting for that in return. Yeah. Um, the other thing um, I'll just throw in here is. Um, especially an allergy where some of these practices may be smaller. Um, I've looked at some practices where actually like a spouse was like the business person um, for mm -hmm. the practice, which I've always been told is like you should, should run as, as quick as you can away from <laughs> the um, I, I might agree. Yeah, I, uh, I prefer when the, you know, the partners are all physicians and that's, that's essentially who the ownership is, and that the, whoever they have employed is their business manager, or office manager. If it's if it's only one person, their spouse, you're you're outnumbered, and and you're always questioning, or I would always question whether or not the financials are accurate, whatever you're being provided with. The um, one other thing before I go on, and you sure. talked about the normal contract in the last slide about um, educational loans. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, is there any um, guidelines for that? Actually. Uh, when I was working for the public health service, there was a colleague of mine that um, a, a group uh, wanted him as soon as they could get him, and they actually bought out his last six months of his public health service contract, which was had a lot of, of uh, fines in it because he was leaving early, um, but they were mm -hmm. willing to pay that to get him to their practice that they you know in a, in a small, relatively rural community. So um, is there... Is, is it the, the educational loan, again, that depend on where you're going, what the demand is? It, it really does. It depends on how, I don't want to use the word desperate, but how aggressive the um, your next employer is for you to come and relocate there. We have seen where, not, not only referencing student loans, but also if there's a signing bonus that's tied to forgiveness as well, we have had employers um, essentially pay for that early termination obligation, so they're, they're paying you know, whatever they need to repay in, in the student loan, the, the next employer is covering that as part of a signing bonus or a direct payment just to get you to relocate and leave your current spot. So it, it is possible, but again, it depends on where you're headed. Okay. Okay. Um, outside interest, if you have any interest in consulting or doing any type of, you know, moonlighting work or anything like that, make sure that that's included in the contract. Um, termination. The with and without cause is really what I want to have you, have you pay attention to. The without cause section is essentially the term of the contract. So even if you have a three-year contract, if there's a 90-day period that they can let you go for absolutely any reason at all, that's really the term. And so it cuts both ways. You know, it protects you as well. If, if you don't like the practice or if you don't, something changes in your life where you need to relocate, you have the ability to leave. But um, you always need to remember that and look out for that clause so you know you know exactly how much security you have in that position. The with cause termination sections, make sure that there's notice and cure provided to you. So if, if there's some type of violation, 
that you can fix, um, you know, you generally want at least 15, 30 days to change the behavior or change the activity uh, so the contract doesn't terminate. And then salary continuation is probably the next biggest item. You know, what happens to not only your base but your productivity um, post-termination? So if you're terminated without cause, um, if your bonus is based on collections, how are how are collections handled if the collections come in after your, your final day of work? Um, you want that language as clear as possible um, in the contract itself. And the last bullet here on this slide is, is talking about boilerplate language. You're going to get to a point in the contract where there's a bunch of short paragraphs at the end. Uh, it's really a bunch of legalese. The only one that you really need to pay attention to is this merger clause where it's titled entire agreement. And it's important because one of the, the most common complaints that we have is, oh, I was told something in the interview, but then two years in, um, you know, they weren't they weren't upholding that promise. And if you go back and look at the contract, it probably wasn't in there. And the merger clause protects the practice and essentially says we're only legally bound to provide you with what's here in this document and anything beyond you know after this date. So promises made prior to the contract, whether they're oral or written, um, they're not legally bound to provide you. So if you would try to enforce a contract, even if you had an email um, from them the day before you signed, saying that call was going to be one in four, um, and then call is actually one in two, uh, you're not going to be able to bring that in. So that's why it's very important to have all the details in the contract as much as possible and make sure that if you were told something orally that it's that's there uh, in writing. Um, restrictive covenants and non-competes. About those, I've been warned on those. They may or may not be enforceable depending on which state you're in. Um, California, for example, they're they're not enforceable, so any contract out there should not have them in it. But all terms, go not ahead. enforceable in Alabama either, where I was. But they're still right. in the contracts. But they're in the contracts, but they're not enforceable. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, they're not enforceable, so it's not a huge issue, but I would prefer, you know, just take them out if, if they can't be enforced anyway. Um, there's no reason for them to be in there. I mean, that's my policy. But if, and there are a handful of states beyond just those two, so make sure you're aware of that. And if, if you're not in a state that has banned them, uh, the terms need to be reasonable. You know, if, if they ever go to court, that's what a judge is going to say, you know, let's, let's see how reasonable these terms are. They look at time, scope, and radius those three factors. So how long are you prevented from practicing? Um, what's the scope? What What is it that you're prevented from doing? And then also the distance, you know, how far, what geographic area are, are you restricted from practicing in? All of those areas need to be reasonable. Um, and you want those obviously as small as possible from your your side of it. The practice wants to have those, you know, large, you want to have them small. So time, hopefully a year uh, or less would be ideal. <coughs> um, the scope, is it is it listed out as the entire practice of medicine? Is it dialed down into your specialty specifically? Um, and then the radius, you know, how far from each facility are you prevented? It, it, like we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of satellite clinics now. Um, and what you need to be careful of, especially if you're in a major metro, is what your restrictive covenant applies to. Is it just the facilities that you worked at? Is it any facility that they own? Um, and the reason for that is if you take a look at a metro like St. Louis, um, we'll see if I can get this to click through here. So if, if that's your primary practice location, but they have satellites throughout the suburbs, and you only work at one, one of those satellites, um, if you decide to leave, and the language in the contract says it's all their facilities, you know, you're, you're, you could be restricted from all of the following areas when you maybe only worked at one of those satellite clinics. So you really need to pay attention to that that language. Um, a couple of areas recently that I would have you pay attention to is try to limit the non-competes if there's any type of merger or acquisition. We've had three or four clients recently, um, some in Missouri, some in Minnesota, some in Philadelphia, that have all showed up for work and three or four days into their, their employment, they were told that the practice got bought out by a health system. And here's the new contract for you to sign. Well, inevitably, that new contract has less pay and more hours, you know, just about in every situation. And if you choose not to sign it, 
the non-compete that you have in your previous contract is, is going to be in play because it reads that it applies in, in any termination regardless of, of how the contract's terminated. So Isn't be very aware of that. Of fraud there? Of, Isn't there some element of fraud there? Well, you can argue that. Um, my so, I mean, my goal for my clients if is they're, they're going to make a, if they're if they're merging or or being bought out that should have been told up front um, and I would think that would be fraud because I mean even if it was in the first month or two months that process takes a long time for that to happen and they know that up front and they should have been up front about that with you. I I completely agree. Um, from a logistical standpoint though what you want to do is try to prevent every type of situation like that that you can in the contract so that way you don't have to go through the court system to try to get that enforced and that's really your goal you're trying to think of all the worst case scenarios that could ever pop up when you're looking at these contracts and trying to prevent them before they become an issue What's I would agree that there's probably fraud but to get that enforced um, is, is another you know is another situation What's the, what's the um, for a major metropolitan area like St. Louis or something, um, mm -hmm. um, what is the, the standard for, um, for the covenant? Is it like um, three miles, five miles, ten miles? Because, you know, literally if you, if you did this ten miles from each of those locations outward, you'd be, met, you'd be moving over to Columbia before you could practice. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's right. Um, it's all based on um, specialty and obviously, you know, patient volume. You know, how many patients are in the area. That what what not why non competes are allowed is to protect business interests, and that's why some states do uphold them is to prevent an employee from coming in and stealing patients and setting up shop right next door. Um, so in a major metro, it's usually a few miles. You know, somewhere between two and five is, is usually what we see. If you're out in Columbia or Jefferson City or somewhere like that, the non competes can get you know, as high as I've seen 75 miles because that's the draw area for that practice and they see patients from, you know, the, the surrounding areas of Jeff City, people drive in. Yeah. So, do you think it's metro, you're looking at a couple miles. So do you think it's reasonable if you're, if you are, um, uh, um, I mean, can you negotiate to be from the main office or um, do you think you're, you know, if you're going to two of the satellites that you just do it from those two satellites? I prefer only locations that you've actually worked at, and honestly, I, I also prefer mostly the majority practice, you know, or the majority office of where you spent your time. If you're in a satellite, you know, five hours a week, um, I, I think the radius around that should be smaller and or it, it's excluded entirely from the non-compete um, because it should be proportional or should be in relation to where you're actually providing service. So, and that's, that's a question I have for you, I actually just went through that part where um, the practice that I'm joining has four locations right now and in my initial non-compete it said within 20 miles of any of the practices and of course mm -hmm. that's four right now but they may have eight in a few years or something like that and right. so when we renegotiated we did ask for you know only from practice satellite clinics or whatever where I worked um, mm -hmm. a majority of my time but they extended the radius to 30 miles once that happened, is that reasonable or? She's going to a relatively, you know, major metropolitan area. I mean, it's like, what is Birmingham, 500,000? About a million. About a million or so. Um, I think 30 miles is, is far too large for a metro. You know, I, I generally in a metro area don't like to see them larger than, you know, five miles is kind of my cap of what I like to see. but. Major metro. I don't know. I'd say compared to like it's probably like half as big as Kansas City. Okay. Spread out over a longer. You know, in a city that size, I don't think you should be forced to relocate entirely out of the city. And so, what I would do is, you know, I'd take a map out and actually draw that 30 mile radius from the two sites and see if there's any other option for you to practice. You know, should it not work out? It's completely, you know, it's it's entirely up to the candidate because some folks will go to a location and they'll say, well, if it doesn't work out, there's no way I'm living here anyway. You know, I'm I'm in more rural Missouri or whatever, so that the non-compete could be 100 miles and they wouldn't care because they're going back to Colorado. So, you know, it's, it's really up to you and where you where you want to be. 
So it would be reasonable to kind of read it because we're not finished with that part of the process. So it would be reasonable to be reasonable to renegotiate that to go back to the 20 mile radius from the like the one or two places where I work. Because mine would be less of being at a main location and going to satellite. Like for part of it, it'd mostly be that I'd probably be at satellite primarily. Sure. So. Um, is there one satellite that you're going to be at more than other? Supposedly. Okay. So is, is it reasonable if there's a satellite, let's say she's spending 60% of her time at, is that the place where she should have the, the radius and not the others? I, I would think so, yeah. I would, I would think that maybe from your main location, if they really think 30 is appropriate, you know, keep it at 30 there. But the other two locations that you're at, try to get those as small as possible. Okay. Thank you. Or, or if they're not open to that, you know, try to lower all of them at the same time. Okay. You just have to, have to feel them out. All right. Okay. Uh, a couple slides left here. Uh, the art of leverage. So do you have leverage in your, in your situation when you're negotiating and how much do you have? Um, obviously, the current market in healthcare, there's a huge shortage in primary care, but, you know, and, and physicians just in general, not just primary care. But there are certain markets that there's really not much of a shortage. Um, you know, there's not a lot of jobs. If you go online, if you look at New York and, and San Diego and these high, higher destination locations where people want to be, um, there, there may not be such a shortage there. So you need to know what the situation is. And there's a lot of consolidation and M&A, mergers and acquisition activity right now. So there is some value to you joining a practice and make sure that you know that. You could increase the value of a practice by being a young physician. Um, and, and we've seen that you know, with, with some of the clients that have come to us after the fact that they go and join a practice and they're sold immediately within that first year. Um, it's generally not by, by accident or by coincidence. Um, we've had practices tell us that they have to sign the contract so they can go on and, and sell it um, to someone else. So just be aware of how much leverage you have based on your situation. And then the next slide here just gives you some general tips uh, on what we see as the biggest mistakes that people make. And the first few are really about committing you know, prior to actually getting the details in writing. And that's very important. Uh, things that are a deal breaker for you, you should have documented it. You shouldn't just take someone's word for it because you don't usually have a relationship with that person prior to joining the practice. So get it, get it documented. Don't give up on plans B or C before you have a contract signed. And Five and six, I think, are important as well. Uh, we have most of our clients will underestimate their leverage, but we do have a few people that will overestimate it and will will cost themselves a position, where they'll push for too much salary, they'll push for something that's unreasonable, and and the practice will just simply pull the offer because it's not a good fit. So understand that as well. Um, make sure you get some type of representation or some help, uh, someone who has knowledge in the area. If it's an attorney, make sure it's a health law attorney. Don't use your, your cousin who does divorce work. Um, it, these contracts are very important to your career, and so I think it's worth the time uh, to have someone review that and help you with that process. Uh, don't let the other side set the time frame too much. Um, we get clients that come to us, and the practice has given them you know, five days to review a contract and get you know, accept or, or decline. Um, in that type of situation, it's usually not a good fit. Um, a good practice will give you enough time to have your counsel, your attorney, your accountant take a look at their financials um, before signing, and, and that's what you should want. You should be able to, to think it over, do your due diligence before signing, and don't allow negotiations to get personal because ultimately you're going to have to go to work with these folks um, you know, in a few months. So um, make sure you keep the relationships as positive as you can. And that's all the comments that I have for you. Are there any other questions on things that we talked on? I don't think so. Thank you. Sure. Um, um, if there are, if, if you have specific questions, I mean, feel free to email me if it's something personal that you don't feel like you want to address right now. Um, my email is up here, and I'd be happy to answer anything I can. Um, I, I, I um, know. Um, about you and your and the company you work for, but um, is you mentioned a health law attorney? Is there mm -hmm. some place you know if you're going to like one of our fellows going to Iowa? You know, um, um, is there is there um, um, 
are there listings of health law attorneys for different states through the American Bar Association or something that um, people could could um, take advantage of? It's a, it's a good question. Um, the Bar Association will have may have practice areas listed out. Unfortunately, attorneys don't get you know board certified like physicians do, so you can't really tell um, what area they practice in without doing some research. So. American Bar Association, you could also call up the uh, Medical Association for each state. Um, you know, MSMA, if you call into MSMA here in Missouri, they'll refer you to us because we handle, you know, the largest volume in the state, and so they feel comfortable sending their clients our way. Um, different states, I don't, I don't know if they have a law firm that they would affiliate with or not, um, but that's, that's a place that I would start is the Medical Association of, of that state. Because that seems to be one of the biggest questions fellows ask me as the program director is that, you know, do I know someone that's, you know, um, a health care attorney or someone that can review, um, you know, sure. contracts. Um, sure. Now, in your case, um, if, if someone was, like one of our fellows going to Alabama, um, <clears> could <throat> you review a contract for, for, for the state that you're not barred in, um, or, or would you not feel comfortable doing that? Yeah, yeah, we do, we do review contracts nationwide, so we see contracts from different states. If there's something that's very unique in them uh, that requires some type of state analysis, you know, specifically, um, we will, what we do is we hire out a, a local attorney there in Alabama to, to help with that process, but the majority of these contracts are very similar, and it's, it's really the business side of it rather than the legal side of it that you need to have analyzed. Um, you know, the numbers are as important as, as the language usually. And so as long as you have a health law attorney, they should be able to handle the language, you know, regardless of location of where they're at. So you, you had also mentioned, I was kind of curious, you mentioned about um, kind of accountants or whatever looking, you know, doing due diligence and such. Um, I mean, in this process, um, is it, is it uh, feasible to be hiring an accountant or something to be, to be looking at the practice's books? It, it, well, it definitely depends on the situation. If it's a private group, they're, they're probably going to turn over some financials to you. And depending on how detailed they are, you may want to have an accountant just take a look at them to see if they, if they look correct, if they're looking like there's any question marks or red flags, you know, if that person would see um, in those. <clears throat> if you're going to a health system or a larger, you know, university, there's, there's really not much to evaluate there. Uh, they're not going to provide you any type of financials or, or things like that. Okay. Um, some practices as well won't actually disclose all of their financials until they offer you partnerships. So it may be something where you're hiring an accountant um, two years in, whatever partnership is being offered to you. Okay. So it just depends on the situation. But I, I would have someone that's familiar with, you know, with with balance sheets, with profit and loss statements that can take a look and, and identify red flags if, you know, if there are any. Uh, and to help explain those to you so you understand exactly where where the money's flowing. So, I mean, in the, the, the stuff that you usually look at, if someone provided some <coughs> balance sheets, um, you know, if it's pretty basic stuff, do you, do you as a lawyer, doing health law feel comfortable looking at it, or, you, or, do you, or are you the one that would help the client make the decision while well, we really need to get an accountant involved here? Yeah, here with our practice, I handle all that. My LLM is in tax, and so I've got you know additional training there. So I feel comfortable looking at all that and, and giving them my feedback. If you're with an outside firm, I don't know what they do. I, I assume most most law firms would have an accountant that they would recommend that they would utilize for that portion. But here, I handle all that just because I feel comfortable with it. Okay, okay. Well, we've taken you past the the hour, and we certainly appreciate you taking the time and and answering all our numerous questions. Today. <laughs> At, so. Any time, and like I said, you've got the email. So if there's other personal questions, feel free to shoot them over. Um, and um, your talk today is being recorded, and um, my um, boss, Dr. Porton, I will edit it and and put it up on the the. COLA uh, website in the uh, iTunes and YouTube account, so um, they'll be accessible. I, I talked to Mr. Christensen, I think Mr. Hines, or Dr. Christensen, Mr. Mm -hmm. Hines, about some of that before, but they, some of these talks that you've given, will, or the talks you've given will, will be edited and will be eventually put up there, so if um, we can give you the addresses, so if you want to direct some of your other um, um, institutions or whatever to those sites to look at, they'd be able to do that. Sure. No, that'd, be, that'd be great. I appreciate that.
Okay. Well, again, thank you, and have a great weekend. Happy Easter. You too. Have a good thank one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.